Music, like any form of art, is about expression, identity, culture, and the truth of someone or a group of people's experience. But music has a deeper power that is outside of music theory and even outside the lyrical components of a song, and it's a power that's much harder to prove. Music has been used as a map to break away from the system of slavery. It's been used as a tool to mobilize groups of people for movements. And some movements created the power needed to influence systemic change. No matter where you go in the world, artists are adored for one reason or another. And for the most part, it's because of the ability and the power behind their skill. This admiration stems from their ability to exemplify an emotion that people on the receiving end can relate to. However, what's interesting to me is how even through a music level, right? So on an artistic level, so specifically with music, that colonization has been able to rip the identities of people, to steal, mutilate, imitate, and manipulate their truth completely taken away the artist's intended power from their art forms. Then, through the passing of time, whole entire industries were created around music for profit. So power and greed have been the blanket on the industry since its inception. I'm gonna talk about the dynamic of these very two real truths, the power of music versus the systemic hold the music industry has through colonization. While I am a huge arts advocate, and I believe that artists deserve to be paid for their art, as a DJ, writer, and producer, I sometimes struggle with the fact that art is beyond an industry. You can't really process my music like eggs for distribution or auction it off in a room for the highest bidder. So what do we do knowing this? I don't know. My history, my culture, my forms of expression were stolen from me through slavery. I have no knowledge of how music was experienced for my ancestors and what it meant to them. All I do know is how my most recent ancestors, the ones who came over here on ships against their will, had to create a new normal, a new culture. I am aware, however, of one famous story about the power of a song created during slavery. This song served as a map that helped slaves escape through the Underground Railroad. It became so popular that even people outside of the African American community to this day know this song. Before I talk about it, let's go back in time a little bit. In the late 1700s, colonizers created the Mason-Dixon Line to resolve the dispute of boundaries between colonies here on indigenous land. So any state north of the Mason-Dixon Line was considered a free state. Any state south was considered a slave state. So around this time frame, African Americans created the Underground Railroad. Not physically underground, the railroad was a path with hidden stops along the way that people would take to escape from the South to the North of the United States with the help of allies. There were many tactics around this time to help enslave Africans understand that the Underground Railroad was real. Tactics through people like Harriet Tubman and tactics through particular music like the song, Follow the Drinking Gourd. The lyrical components of this song served as a map that told slaves which direction to go in if they had the courage to leave the bonds of their slave masters. The gourd, in the context of this song, um, was known amongst the enslaved Africans as the, Big Dip, as the Big Dipper. The shape of the drinking gourd matched exactly the shape of the underbelly of the Big Dipper, which is a constellation in our northern hemisphere. They used the major stars visible to the eye to help guide them, spreading the message, the map, and the lyrics. Follow the drinking gourd. Around the 1930s, 
My great-grandfather, Willie Fields, lived and worked in Arkansas. Every day, he would leave his house, and a member of the Ku Klux Klan would intentionally let his dog out to attack him. So day after day, over and over, as he was going and coming, he would be attacked, bitten, chewed, simply for being black and trying to live his life. Now, he knew his neighbor was hateful, but he didn't know he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, that is the reason why they wore hoods, so they couldn't be identified. One day, my great-grandfather Willie, he had enough. He left his house, he brought a gun, and he shot the Klan man's do dead, dog dead. And the next morning, my family awoke to a burning smell. Now, like many African Americans experience in this country, around this time, a burning cross in their yard was a signal that if you didn't move out of town or run, they would hunt you down and they would murder you. Some families' entire houses were burned down as the members of the KKK would throw Molotov cocktails in the windows of those who didn't move. And many times, women and children were inside the homes. Murders like this were swept under the rug. They were never brought to court. And if they did make it to court, there was no justice for those who were hurt. My great-grandpa Willie, he did not want that for his family, so he decided to flee north. I found out during part of his escape journey that a Jewish family actually hid him in a horse-drawn flatbed cart where he made his way to Chicago, but he hated Chicago, so he kept going all the way here to Minnesota where my family settled. The same reasons why my great-grandfather had to escape from Arkansas were rooted in the same hateful reasons why slaves created the Underground Railroad to escape from the South. And this song is burned into the memories of us all for generations to come. Not only was it used as a tool to mobilize groups of people to break away from a system which dehumanized them, but it was used as an actual map and compass to help them escape from that system. So after slavery ended, after the many industrial revolutions, technology advancement and world connectivity started to influence not only our systems for profit here in the United States, but the systems in the music industry. The power was still there. Through the invention of computers, phonographs, record players, microphones, music software system, Speakers, a track players, cassette players, CD players, the internet, streaming services, wireless devices connected to everything. We now get to experience as much as we want whenever we want and we can't be stopped. However, our human minds have never really experienced access to entertainment and information like this. Access that can sometimes be excess and affect our moods, our behaviors, that influences our culture. But colonization, never went away. In fact, it is more integrated into every pocket of our society through systemic racism, through laws, through technology, through cultural norms. It's even embedded into the terminology in the music industry, like the word masters, as it relates to song ownership. So when we are talking about the power of influence that music has for positive or negative, we are still talking about the ability to persuade or heighten the emotions of massive amounts of people. And if emotions are heightened, movements can be mobilized. So you could say, metaphorically, that the internet and technology poured gasoline on the persuasion that is music for society, whether it's for good or for bad. So it's up to us to decolonize for good in every single way we possibly can. In 2020, Minneapolis became famously known all around the world as a city in which George Floyd was murdered at the hands of the police. Murders of black men, women, and young people in this state was nothing new. It was only when the world was forced to listen because everything was shut down that they heard the screams that we have been broadcasting since slavery. So for the following year or so after George was murdered, companies here in Minnesota felt obligated to hire more black people as to not be looked at in any relation to the systemic racism that they played an active role in. 
And this manifested in the arts world. So black artists were getting money thrown at them. They were getting job opportunities thrown at them, which were still pennies to these institutions. In 2021, I was invited to DJ a set at a series of summer programming at a predominantly white prestigious art institution in Minneapolis. They wanted me to fit into a four part series they had already been organizing. And they thought when they had the initial conversation with me that I'd easily lock into one and it would be done. But one conversation turned into two or three conversations over the course of three to four months. They didn't want to say no to me because they needed black artists. But I didn't want to say yes to them because I knew they needed black artists. And I wanted to do my own thing. So during these conversations, I expressed how I was more than a DJ and I was a producer and I was about to release my first album with all my production featuring 12 incredible local artists, one of which you're going to hear at the end of this talk. So long story short, instead of me fitting into pre-existing programming, I got to DJ my own set on a Friday night, which is hard to do as a DJ, with no other programming before or after. I got to help showcase three of the artists that were on my album in which they all got paid to perform too. I made sure of it. I got an ice cream food truck for my attendees and I ended up closing out the night playing Kendrick Lamar, Baby Keem, and the blackest radio edited music that I could get my hands on. That moment was historic for me and my people who showed up. I temporarily decolonized an event hiring system. My hope is that artists who decide to participate in the music industry will see the beauty and the possibilities in our modern world, but that they do not forget the past. We can take back power and start controlling the music industry from the inside out in a way that it hasn't seen since its inception. And one of the ways we can do this is through ownership. Now, historically, labels wouldn't even move forward with offering a record deal unless artists signed their music rights away. And one of the shady outcomes of this used to mean that every time music was sold, the label would determine the dollar amount that the artist would receive. So, for an example, in the past, every dollar made off of a CD sale, artists will only make a few cents, sometimes less than that, after the label got their cut. And we're talking top-selling artists. When confronted with these record deals that were always contractual, most artists were blinded by the very clear legal terminology around the advance that they would receive, like dollar amount signs. However, this was surrounded by a ton of intentionally more confusing legal terminology. So oftentimes, artists didn't even know what they were signing. These contracts would be hundreds of pages long. So to this day, artists are signing away their right to potentially make millions of dollars off of their music into the future and instead end up becoming the property of record labels. In 1996, Prince did an interview with the Rolling Stone and said a line that would have gone viral in modern day times. He said, if you don't own your music masters, your masters own you. Now, while he was talking about music masters, he was not so subtly letting black artists know that colonization in the music industry is real. He oftentimes would even have the word slave written across his face when he would perform. So really quick, for those who don't know what a music master is, it is the original copy of a song before it's mass produced. So previously, it was produced onto something like a record, cassette, something tangible, but now it is streamed through entities that display it across music platforms, right? And so only in recent decades have artists started to wake up and realize that if the label owns your masters and your copyrights, they essentially have complete power over you and power over your art. And that people are just now starting to understand you only really need a distribution deal. To quote Prince again, because he was like our modern day Harriet Tubman, and I love him. He said, labels aren't going to exist much longer. He then goes on to say, it shouldn't be a situation where they own the album or the work. We're talking about intellectual copyrights. If they are going to indeed be a delivery service, then that's fine. But even FedEx doesn't say they own 
the thing they deliver. I copyright my music. I negotiate my own contracts as a DJ and producer, and I try to help others with theirs. I'm a member with the ASCAP Association. These are stops along my modern day railroad that I choose to take. So while my drinking gourd is not the compass and the stars, and I can't be hidden in someone's horse-drawn flatbed cart to get to freedom, I can use the power that I have to decolonize in any way I can. And I can work with others who are finding pathways in our modern day systems for profit. And we will figure out together what this freedom looks like. So no matter if you are fighting a curriculum at your college or university to decolonize, or if you are creating systems that break the political, economic, military predominance of one nation over another, or one ethnicity over another to decolonize, or if you are representing non-white perspectives in your fields of work, it is up to us all to decolonize in any way we possibly can. My name is DJ Cassiopeia. Free, grow, thrive, live like you are an ancestor, yo, life. Get free, grow, thrive, live like you are an ancestor, yo, life. Get look, grow, thrive. I know that we're contending with a lot of things right now, you know what I mean? We're all trying to figure out what our lane is, what survival is, what our lane is, we got people at our neck. Right, literally. Peace to the ancestors. George Floyd. Here's the thing, though. The time is actually right now for us to get up and activate. With each other and orient towards some positive change. We got the ancestors at our back, on our side, and holding us down, ten toes down, our ways, up and around, all directions. So it's up to us to move the agenda of our liberation forward. If you're not about that action, you might want to step aside. Because at this point, it's now or never. So get free, grow, thrive. Let's make a better world for ourselves. Let's go. Beautiful. Hey, y'all. <laughs>